Turning in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4 tonight. First Timothy chapter 4, and we want to just read the first verse. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we pray that you would bless our study of your word tonight. <clears throat> and we pray that you would take us uh, into your thoughts from these words and help us to, for a few moments, sit quietly before you. We might hear the message that you have for us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to come back to our studies in First Timothy tonight, and as we do that, we come to a new chapter. And it's one that begins with a warning about the dangers of the last days. Notice again the opening words of chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. It's instructive that as Paul begins his warnings about the dangers of the last days, that he begins, I believe, with a warning that involves the Word of God. He begins with a defense, as it were, of the inspiration of the Word of God. Paul is suggesting to Timothy, and he is suggesting to you and me, that this is going to be an issue in the latter times. An issue that is going to cause division an issue over which some are going to depart from the faith. He begins by telling Timothy that it is the Spirit that speaketh expressly. These are not Paul's words. They're the words of the Spirit of God. That's inspiration. The first definition, the first Bible definition, I believe, of inspiration is found back in the book of Exodus. If you'll turn back to Exodus chapter 31, and I know that people are tired on Sunday night, and you may be especially tired today if maybe you had to travel and visit family or you had family to come in and visit you. But I think it's important that we consider some of these things tonight around this issue of the Word of God. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18 is the definition of inspiration. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony. I'd like for you just for something that we're going to talk about in a few minutes to think about the word testimony there or make a mental note of it. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. I believe those last words are the Bible definition or the definition period of inspiration written with the finger of God. Now look over at the book of Deuteronomy because there's something else that we need to see that goes hand in hand with inspiration. 
Deuteronomy chapter uh, 9 is where we want to look. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, Moses is recounting to the children of Israel something of their history. And sad to say, their history, like our history, is a history of, history of their rebellion against God. Notice what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 7. Remember and forget not. How thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came unto this place. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb ye provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. Notice that. The Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone. And here's our definition of inspiration again. Written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence. For thy people which thou hast brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. Now look at verse 15. Moses says, So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. I've written a little note in my Bible uh, beside verse 17 that says, The original manuscripts were gone. The original manuscripts were gone. I think that's worth noting. So what are the people of God going to do? They no longer have the original manuscripts. How are they going to have the Word of God? Look over a page, Deuteronomy chapter 10. And verse 1. At that time, the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. Here in chapter 10, we have entered into a post-original manuscript world, if you will. The original tables, the original manuscripts are gone. And so here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, God introduces the other side of the coin of inspiration. The other side of the coin of inspiration is preservation. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, we have the pattern of how God is going to preserve His inspired world for people who live in a world where the original manuscripts are gone. I believe this is very important for you and I to have ingrained in our thinking. Because we're living in these latter times when the Spirit speaketh expressly that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
And one of the seducing spirits of our time, of the latter days, of the latter times, one of the doctrines of devils is, in, involves the Word of God. That's why there are hundreds of versions out there on the market. I think it's important for us to think about these things. Moses says, at that time the Lord said unto me, notice the next words there in verse 1, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. The first two tables of stone were hewed by God. He cut them out. He wrote on them with his finger and he gave them to Moses. But here God tells Moses to hew two tables of stone. He tells Moses not only to hew two tables of stone, but he tells him to also make an ark. I believe that tells us that beginning right here in chapter 10 of the book of Deuteronomy, God is going to use man in the preservation of his word. And just as a, as a side thought here, I think it's important to notice the kind of man that he's going to use in the preservation of his word. Moses went up into the mount unto the Lord, and he went with two blank tables of stone. Moses went up into the mount with no agenda. He wrote nothing on there before he went. There were none of his thoughts on these stones. There were none of his footnotes. There was nothing of his scholarship, nothing of what he thought God's Word should say. There were no notes of, uh, of textual criticism or word changes that Moses thought maybe would make the Ten Commandments more readable or easier for uh, the, the people to understand. Moses went up into the mount to hear from God. He did not go up into the mount for God to hear from him. He went with two blank tables of stone. So here in Deuteronomy chapter 10 is the doctrine of preservation. God used a man. He used Moses in the preservation of his word. Moses hewed the two tables of stone. He made the ark of wood. He put the two tables in the ark of wood, we see in verse 5. There's a very critical point here about preservation that we need to note. And the point is this. While God was pleased to use man in the preservation of his word, the preservation of the Word of God was not dependent on man in any way. God was pleased to use man in the preservation of His Word, but the preservation of His Word was not dependent on man in any way. Just as inspiration of the Word of God is dependent on God and God alone, so Two is preservation dependent upon God and God alone. That's illustrated for us here. And it's illustrated in a very beautiful way. It's illustrated here in this ark, this ark of wood. Now, there's only one ark. I believe that the children of Israel built. Directions had been given for it before the people corrupted themselves and turned aside and made them a molten calf and worshipped it. Look back at, at the book of Exodus for just a minute. Exodus chapter 25. Directions for the ark had been given before, before the people corrupted themselves, before Moses came down from the mount and broke 
those first two tables of stone. Look back at Exodus chapter 25 and verse 10. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And notice verse 16. And thou shalt put into the ark of the testimony, and thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Remember a minute ago I asked you to keep that word testimony in mind. That testimony was a reference to the tables, the first two tables that God gave to Moses that he wrote on with his finger and gave them to him and when Moses came down from the mount the first time. In verse 16, God's plan, God's design was for Moses to put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. So here are the instructions for building the ark along with the instructions for what was to go in it. Now, if you'll turn over to Exodus chapter 37, Exodus chapter 25, we have the instructions. In Exodus chapter 37, we'll, we'll see the construction of the ark. Exodus chapter 37 and verse 1. And Bezaliel made the ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without, and made a crown of gold to it round about. Now, if you look at Exodus chapter 40, just over a few pages, we'll see the tabernacle set up. Now, remember, when we're reading in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and Deuteronomy chapter 10, Moses is recounting history. He's, he's, we, we can take that history and, and plug it back in here, but he's recounting to the children of Israel before they go into the promised land something of their history. Well, here's uh, in, in Exodus chapter 40, the tabernacle is set up, the ark is built, the ark is in the tabernacle, and if you look at verse 20, you'll notice what went into the ark. And he took and put the testimony into the ark, and set the staves on the ark, and put the mercy seat above the ark. The testimony, the two tables of stone went into the ark. So let's think about what we have as we think about Deuteronomy chapter 10. We have this ark made from shittim wood and overlaid with pure gold. If you have Pastor Kelly's book on Bible symbolism, an interesting picture emerges from the ark. Wood is a symbol of humanity. Gold is a symbol of deity. And so wood overlaid with pure gold would be humanity overlaid with deity. That's an Old Testament description of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was fully man. He was fully God. But that the picture is uniquely related to something. Turn over to John chapter 1. We didn't turn to these verses this morning. We, we mentioned them um, in the message. But I want us to look at them tonight. Um, Sunday night maybe tends to, me to be more of a, a, a Bible study. And I think it's good for us to see these things in the Word of God. Turn over to John chapter 1 and, and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is another name for God. A unique name for Him. Now notice verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There's the ark of Deuteronomy chapter 10. Wood overlaid with pure gold. Humanity overlaid with deity. And His name is the Word of God. Now, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and notice verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And I should have told you to keep your finger there. I should have kept my finger there. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 10. And we want to read verse 5. Moses says, And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I had made, and there they be, as the Lord commanded me. The picture here is that the word written was placed, the word written was preserved by the ark. The word written was preserved by the word living. Folks, God used man in the preservation of His Word, but the preservation of the Word of God was not dependent on man in any way. It was and it is dependent on God and God alone. Not only has He taken to Himself the personal responsibility of inspiring His Word, but He has taken to Himself the personal responsibility of preserving that word. We see something else here. Moses hewed the two tables of stone. Moses made the ark of wood. Moses put the tables in the ark. But God wrote on this second set of tables, just like he did on the first. We see that here in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 2. God says, and I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables. I will write. That's inspiration. It's repeated in verse 4 in the testimony of Moses. He witnessed this. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments. Now I want you to think about what that means. It means that preservation of the Word of God had no effect on the inspiration of the Word of God. Inspiration was not lost in preservation. The people of God no longer had the original tables of stone. They no longer had the original manuscripts, if you will. They were gone. But in spite of that, God preserved His Word. And there was absolutely no difference in inspiration between the first tables of stone, the original manuscripts of Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, and the second set of tables, the preserved Word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Now folks, that ought to make the spiritual hair stand up on our neck. What we're reading about here is one of the patterns, one of the critical patterns of the Word of God. The pattern concerning, I believe, how we can know if we have the Word of God today. And when you examine the pattern here, and you compare which Bible of all the hundreds out there that have their, that name on their cover, which Bible follows the pattern of Deuteronomy chapter 10? I believe there's only one. Only one. And that's the King James Bible. The King James Bible that we have in our laps and we have in our hands tonight. We do not have the original manuscripts. But in spite of that, in spite of what 
the scholars and the wise people of this world would say, God has preserved his word. And there's absolutely no difference in inspiration between the original manuscripts and the preserved word of God that we hold in our hand tonight. It's one of the key points of the battle that we face on this subject. Inspiration was not lost in preservation. But there's one more point that I'd like for us to see about preservation. Look over in, in, in the book of 1 Kings for just a minute. 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8. Well, actually, we'll look at, at chapter 7 and we'll read the last verse of chapter 7 to, um, to get the context. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. Even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place into the ark of the house to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. Now look at verse 9. They brought in the ark. And now we're going to be told what was in it. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at, Mount, at Horeb. Deuteronomy chapter 10. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. If you look at, if your Bible has a chronology, we're 450 years beyond the point of Deuteronomy chapter 10. And here's the inspired Word of God preserved for the people of God. Nothing's been added to it. Nothing has been taken from it. It hasn't been revised. It hasn't been retranslated. It hasn't been paraphrased. But there's something else here that is, is worth noting. We're looking at this, this preservation of God's Word, and we're looking at it in the reign of Solomon. That's important. Solomon is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as the King of glory. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as the King of glory. Over in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, and I believe it's the 15th verse we read, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign as the King of in glory forever and ever. And that's how long the Word of God is going to be preserved. Forever and ever. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. There, there's one other place, one other scripture I want you to look at. It's uh, Psalms chapter 12. Or the 12th Psalm, I should say. Psalms... 12. Because in the light of that, looking at this preservation of the Word of God in the reign of Solomon, this, 
This man who is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in his reign as King of kings and Lord of lords forever and ever. It's how long his word's going to be preserved. The words of Psalm 12 in verse 6 and 7 are true. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. That's inspiration. That's inspiration. And verse 7 is preservation. The other side of the coin. And notice who's in charge of preservation. Notice where the words are. They're in the ark. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. For how long? Forever. Forever. The Word of God, inspired and preserved, it is the issue of this hour. It is the issue of this hour. How, do you, how, how a, a church, how a ministry stands on this issue it is critically important. I believe it's the reason that Paul begins his warnings about the dangers of the last days with this very issue by putting forth the principle, the doctrine of the inspiration of the Word of God. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you tonight for this little study together that reminds us again of the great blessing that we have in your Word. Your Word that's not only inspired but preserved. Preserved. We thank you that you've given it to us tonight. You've placed a copy of it in our hands. What a responsibility that is how lightly we take that responsibility. And we consider how many tonight would be in peril of their life and would gladly be in peril of their life to have even a few pages from this book. And yet here we are in America, most of us with many copies of your word. And yet how little time we spend in it. We pray that you would convict us tonight. And Father, we pray that you would help us to think about these things and understand them, that we might contend for the faith, earnestly contend for the faith in these latter times. Earnestly contend for your word. Stand for it. Believe it. Preach it without apology or without compromise. And to that end, we pray that you would continue to bless this ministry and help us to be found faithful when you come. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.